thank you um, very much indeed um, for that welcome. I've never been to GWC before, so it's my first time and I was persuaded because Vianney came and sat in my garden in Cambridge where I live and said, look, if ever you come to South Africa, um, please come and visit GWC. And I thought it was pretty unlikely, actually. So I made a promise, yeah, okay, if ever I come, of course, I'll come down and see you. Well, <laughs> here I am, because I uh, come to South Africa to launch this book, which I'm doing tonight, did it in Joburg, at, at, um, George, at um, Johannesburg Bible College School, is corporate capitalism, the best we've got to offer. Because actually, most of my work has not been in the churches, but in society, in peace building work in South Africa, Sudan, Rwanda, and currently in Korea, between North and South Korea. That's my current day job. So most of my work's actually been done in society rather than in the churches, although, um, so I'm not sure if relational leadership in the churches is going to be quite my strong card. You really should have had my son talking about that. He did it so much better than I would. Um, by the way, it's always very daunting speaking if you have your son in the audience, <laughs> because you know he's going to tell you how you could have done it better afterwards. <laughs> Um, and he always actually uh, is, is generally right, unfortunately. I can take that for coffee if you like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a very kind offer. I'm very tempted. Um, anyway, I'm grateful for the invitation from Mark Dixon and Vianney and the faculty here to come and uh, talk to you this morning. And um, I thank you all students for turning up uh, to listen. Um, I have found this a very challenging talk to prepare. Um, because I always think of myself more as a pioneer than as a, uh, a leader and um, I think my particular gift has been developing thinking, uh, ideas, different ways of seeing things that are around us. I just wanted to mention a couple of the other books that are going into your library. Uh, there is something that was written up by a colleague from South Africa actually. His parents lived just down the road from here originally. Um, but he and I worked together on peace building and the ending of apartheid. And we, uh, this paper he wrote up on the process that we were involved in. If you're interested, look at that. Um, we also produced a book, um, again for a secular audience, um, but you can probably read the summary in about 10 minutes. It's called Relational Rights and it's a way of redefining the whole human rights agenda. And we have strong endorsements from uh, senior Africans, Chinese, Russians, I mean all sorts of senior people from other um, parts of the world have endorsed this because they say, well, you know, US and, um, and Europe is only 13.5% of the world's population today. Uh, the future is with Africa, by the way. One in three people on the planet, apparently, by the end of the century, will be from Nigeria. <laughs> uh, those are the statistics on current trends. So anyway, um, Relational rights redefines the human rights agenda in relational terms and actually shifts, shifts the whole way in which the UN potentially should operate. Anyway, it's an, a bold book and of course it does somewhat uh, take an axe to the root of the tree of the work culture. So if you're interested in that, then do um, take a look at that. There's a book called The Jubilee Roadmap, which is about looking at the whole biblical law through a relational lens, written by a friend of mine. Um, there is a book on, uh, called After Capitalism, Rethinking Economic Relationships. It's 14 essays. I'm an economist, basically. I trained at Cornell, worked at World Bank, all that stuff in the past. And um, he and uh, Paul Mills was a, a very, very senior IMF economist, banking and finance, much better economist than me, I think. Anyway, he and I did 14 essays uh, for this book. They were all published as Cambridge papers which you can also access on the internet. Um, and my passion is that we should keep Sunday, one day a week, uh, as a special day to defend low-income people, make sure they get a day off, make sure we have time, our most precious resource, make sure there is time to give to our families and our communities. Uh, we need time, time is our scarcest resource, not money, it's time. We need to have a shared day off. And I fought a campaign against Mrs. Thatcher in the 1980s, which by God's amazing grace we won, um, even though she had a huge majority in our UK Parliament. Anyway, that was back in the 80s, um, in my political campaigning days, and uh, we wrote this book to try and explain to the churches why there is a solid argument for keeping Sunday special in the light of the whole of Scripture. 
So if you're interested in that, that's in your game video library as well. And that's just a few things that will be there. Plus there will be a copy of this book on capitalism. So if any of you are bored, because I know that it isn't a very stretching curriculum here, then you can go and look at the library. Um, so, um, my main interest in my life has been how do you bring the values of the Christian faith into public life where the majority of people are not actually believers. Even in the Old Testament, uh, when the law was given, you know, all Israel, except for a couple of guys, died in the wilderness. They never made it to the promised land. <coughs> So the question is, um, how do you communicate those values into public life? That's where I started from. But I'll explain to you how I got to where I am now, a little later in what I want to say, but I think rather for now I'm going to just dive into this topic. So here are some observations. So my, the title you will remember is Some Observations for Christians on Relational Leadership. I don't think of myself as a great relational leader. I'm just giving you my observations. Having thought a lot about this relational idea, uh, I'm hoping that some of them will resonate with you, help you to think differently, help you to think about leadership differently. So I think we all recognize, we all recognize, Certainly this college recognizes, as you've just heard from the principal's message, that relationships are core to the running of an institution. And institutions have to be thought of, whether they're companies or schools or hospitals or police stations or have worked in prisons quite a lot, but all of them are about stakeholders. Who are the stakeholder groups and how do they relate to each other as stakeholder groups? And I shall talk about that in the context of companies this evening. But think about the Christian faith. Fundamentally, what are its unique features? Well, the Trinity is a different way of thinking about God. God is relational within himself. It solves the problem of the one and the many. Uh, as the philosophers tell us, how can God on one hand be one, so that there is one person at the center of the universe, and how can we recognize the value and benefits of diversity? Um, covenant is a long-term commitment, whether it's in a marriage or whether it's be between ethnic groups in a, in a state. It's about covenant, it's about a long-term commitment. And the purpose of the cross, of course, is um, Relational, ultimately, it is to restore relationships between us and our Heavenly Father. So, imagine um, the, the <clears throat> defining moment in world history from a Christian point of view is the cross. It's not a financial event. It's not a military event, as in Islam. This is, this is a relational event. The language that is used in the Bible is all about forgiveness, reconciliation, that's all the language. These are relational categories. And it is not simply about uh, me and Jesus. It is about the household of faith. The language, again, in the New Testament is all about brother and sister. And uh, the household of faith that Jesus talks about uh, in John 17, we take it all for granted. It's just rolls over our head, we're so familiar, we, we all love it, we all accept it. This is who we are as Christians. We believe in this relational understanding of the world. The question is how much do we apply it? Do we, uh, how much do we use it as the basis on which we critique other faiths, other worldviews, human rights, or whatever it may be? How much do we use this relational worldview to even critique capitalism, socialism, Marxism, or all the other ideologies of our day? And heaven is a is seen by Jesus as a feast. He repeatedly uses this idea of a feast. Um, I had a great friend um, who was a funder of ours actually as well, but he fought the Sunday campaign with me as a, as a major retailer. He worked in the Bank of England, etc. Anyway, uh, at his funeral, uh, someone spoke up to, to speak about him and said that what he'd said as one of his last comments was, if you want to find me in heaven, um, go to the desserts table, I'm sure to be there. 
I should be dead too, by the way. Um, but it's so different from, let's say, Hinduism uh, or, or Buddhism, because there the idea is that I go on my karma, my journey, and the eventual goal is to have no relationships. I'm like a drop of water that drops in a huge pond, and I'm absorbed in the great nothingness. There's no relationships. I'm part of everything, everything is part of me, that's what it is. Whereas for us Christians, relationships, what heaven is going to be is the ultimate deepening of relationships. Our relationships now are relatively shallow compared with what they will be when we are in heaven with one another and above all, of course, with Christ himself. And if you think about a relationship, there is no limit to how well you can get to know somebody else. So I've been happily married to Nat's mother, <laughs> my wife, for uh, 53 years. And I have to tell you, she still does things that surprise me. <laughs> 53 years. Couldn't I predict her behavior by now? Well, no, I can't. <laughs> I can predict some things. I know she always likes tea in the morning. But uh, there's an awful lot I can't predict. So, uh, relationships are always interesting, always refreshing, always exciting. So, uh, there are alternative ways to see the world. Think of buying a microwave oven. Do you think about, can I afford it? How much is it going to cost to run? Do I think about the environmental implications? Is it more efficient? Is it more efficient to, um, in terms of the heat loss, in terms of the energy use, all of those kinds of things? Um, or this building, you might look at it financially, what it costs to run, upkeep, maintain, uh, near the sea, everything. Uh, or how much um, energy is it using? Or you might think about the personal convenience of having a microwave. Oh, I can dash into the house, I can have food whenever I like it, I just sack it in the microwave, it's so convenient for everybody, and especially for me. Or, did you ask the question, do you ask the question, what is the relational impact of having a microwave oven in your house? Now, less than 25% of British households now have a dining room table. Less than 25% of British households now have a dining room table. Why do we need a dining room table? Because we can all come into the house whenever we like, we'll zap our food, go to our rooms, look at our you know, social media, look at our television, whatever it might be. Why do we need a dining room table? But conversations are the very essence and heart of what relationships are about. How do we get to know people without conversations? It's significant that the beginning of John's Gospel says, in the beginning was the Word. Word is about communication. The Word of God is God speaking to us, talking to us, and we talk to Him in prayer. It's all about conversations. Now, you all know this, of course. It's kind of, I'm telling you the obvious, aren't I? And yet, have we thought through the full implications of it? In terms of whether we buy, or what we think about when we buy a microwave oven, or when we build a building, or whatever other area of life we might want to think about. Do we think about it when we're thinking about schools and the curriculum in schools, which I will come back to in a moment, and do we think about the nature of how we build relationships in a college? These are all the kinds of questions that interest me that came out of this initial fundamental understanding. So, uh, pushing on from there, think about science. Um, quantum physics, here's a quote from a lady called Margaret Wheatley who wrote a book called Leadership and the New Science. And she says, in the quantum world, subatomic particles come into form and are observed. They kind of only exist. They come into form and are observed only as they are in relationship to something else. They do not exist as independent things. So we may talk about a quark or whatever it may be, some subatomic particles, but we can't think about them, observe, about, observe them or anything else unless they are in relationship to something else. And two of these things at the far ends of the universe are somehow communicating with each other, we don't know how. So if one decides to start revolving faster, the other one at the other end of the universe will also start revolving faster. We have no idea how that happens. They're somehow connected. 
or a friend of mine's in neurobiology, he's a very famous neuroscientist, and he says it's not really about individual cells anymore, it's about how cells relate to one another, what's going on between them. So it's a shift of mindset within science itself to begin to understand that a relational God, of course, creates human beings as relational beings and creates things as relational things as well. Think about society. I'm, I'm, I'm an economist, so I've spent my life thinking about how does this idea of relationships impact on the way the different parts of a society connect to one another. A good society is defined by the way that it connects its members. How does the economy affect the way people connect with each other? How does capital and the flow of capital affect the way people relate? So people who are the funders used to put money into companies and it was kind of a personal association with the founder or the people working in it. That's how the system worked. But today, you buy and sell your shares in microseconds on stock exchanges around the world. A friend of mine in Cambridge was, <laughs> was paid huge sums of money to develop a, a means of being able to trade on the uh, US stock exchanges in a millionth of a second instead of a hundred thousandth of a second. Because if you could be the first to make the change on the stock exchange, you could make a lot of money and people only own the shares, you know, for a zillionth of a second before they may be traded at a game. How can you influence the people who've got your money? How can you have any responsibility for the people who've got your money if you only own a share for a millionth of a second? So there's something wrong there if we believe in a relational world, I believe. Or the environment. What is your motivation? for wanting to look after the environment? Is it because you think the environment is just a beautiful thing? Gaia, as it's called in the West. I don't know if you know this term, Gaia, to describe the environment. I think it probably comes out of India. Um, but of course, the Christian motivation is relational. We love God, who told us that we had a responsibility to look after it. If we abuse it, if we don't take care of it, if we don't even pick up the litter on the streets, if we don't take care of the environment in some significant way, we're abusing our relationship with God who asked us to take care of it for Him. And it is a responsibility to our neighbour as well. And issues of personal identity, which I've mentioned, so I can move on from that. So, I think relational leaders also understand the Bible differently from those with an individualistic mindset. Now these are subtle shifts of emphasis, I think, and again, I hope you'll agree and understand uh, what I'm saying. So think of, the, uh, of our great understanding of scripture as a plan of salvation, uh, creation, fall, redemption, and so on. It isn't only about um, how God saves me. It is fundamentally relational in two senses. It is God's plan. How do how does God create again a relationship with us? How does God do that? That's the purpose of this whole great plan, is to bring about a restored relationship between us. Have you had a good trip to work? Now, did you ask me something about boxes? And the point was, he knew that he needed to connect to me as a person before we started discussing boxes at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning. And it was a huge lesson to me how quickly I just blast into a conversation with somebody without ever thinking about, well, where are they in their lives? What is going on with them today? What are the issues that they're struggling with? And I can't go into their entire life history on a telephone call, you understand. But I can at least register the fact that I know they're a human being. I know this person is somebody with feelings like me and you. And that personal communication is so important in terms of, of just building relationships and community with other people and getting them to feel that, that you know that they're important as a person. But think of this gospel passage. Um, think of uh, 
Luke, I think it's Luke, Mark, maybe. Um, Jairus' daughter, maybe it's Mark 5. So Jairus' daughter, you know the story I'm sure very well, he comes off the boat, Jairus says, please come and heal my daughter. They go along, there's a lot of crowds, and then this woman touches the edge of his cloak, and then Jesus stops, he wants to hear this woman's story, he will not move on until he's heard the woman's story. And telling your story in the Middle East does not take two minutes, it probably takes 20 minutes or half an hour to hear the story of how she is where she is. And then he says to her, then he says to her, my daughter, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Do you remember the story? Have you ever thought, who is he speaking to? Who is he speaking to when he says that? Well, of course he's speaking to the woman, isn't he? He's addressing her, my daughter. Why does he call her my daughter? I mean, she's probably older than him. Why does he call her my daughter? Well, it's partly because, of course, it's part of the Godhead. He's the Heavenly Father. He calls her my daughter. But there's somebody else listening in the room, very carefully, as it were, in the room. And that is Jairus, because he's just asked Jesus to come and save his daughter. So Jesus, as well as speaking to the woman, is addressing Jairus, I think, and saying, Jairus, here is my daughter in front of me. Can't you see that I have to save her first? She is here in front of me, and she is my daughter. Now, let's go and sort out your daughter as well, because I know how you're feeling. I know what it feels like to be a father. I know what it feels like to have a daughter who's dying. But I needed to sort out my daughter here first. But do we miss that? Because we're thinking, we're not thinking about the stakeholders in situations. We're not thinking about who else is there. We're just so focused on one thing. And one of the interesting things I learned about relationships is that any relationship you have affects third parties. We wrote a, a wonderful book back at the Jubilee Center. I thought it was one of our great publications, actually. It's written by um, the same guy who wrote the Jubilee Roadmap. It's called Just Sex. Is it ever just sex? Just sex. Is it ever just sex? Now, just has two meanings in English, as I think you all know. It can either mean, is it only sex? Or it can mean, is it justice type sex? It can mean either. So just sex and just sex in that title can be translated four ways, potentially. Anyway, the point he makes is, that if anyone has a sexual act with another human being, you always have to say, who are the third parties who are affected by that sexual act? Because other people will be affected. It may be that you pass on chlamydia so that some future partner never has children because of you having a one-night stand with that person. Or it may be that um, your relatives, your parents, your, your other uncles and aunts, that they're affected by the fact that this sexual relationship took place that night. But there are always third-party consequences. Sex is a profound relational act, as I think we all know from what Scripture teaches. But he is arguing that there's also these third-party consequences in a sexual act which have to be taken into account. Coming back to uh, scripture though, there's the practical issues in the Acts and the Apostles. But I'll just tell you very quickly how I got into this relational thinking myself. So I, I've been studying biblical law for five or six years because my pastor in uh, Eden Baptist Church in Nairobi, where I was based at that time, had been saying, you know, preaching uh, all the stuff about socialism and Marxism, I said to him, well, where, where is a biblical alternative to these ideologies? Where do I go for a biblical alternative? And he said, well, I don't know for certain. It can't be in the New Testament in the kingdom of God because that assumes you have the Holy Spirit and most people out there in the world don't have the Holy Spirit, so it can't be the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom of believers and it is the ultimate sign of what right relationships are about. Uh, but... Um, he said, biblical law does not assume that, so go study biblical law. Oh, sorry that somebody's got an embarrassment. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, right. Okay, so, um, so I went to study biblical law, and then I had a problem. 
if you had to summarize the whole of biblical law in one big idea, so socialism about society, capitalism is about fundamentally about capital and its growth, Marxism is about ideas of Karl Marx, what's the big idea in biblical law? What's the one big idea? And where do you find Jesus address that question? Stunned silence. <laughs> Someone must have an idea. No? Well, Jesus. Oh, yes, there is an idea. Thanks. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, so he's asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? And you remember, he can't give it in one commandment, just give it in two commandments, love God, love your neighbor. And then he answers my question. He says, on these two laws hangs all the law and the prophets. Why he sees it as hanging like that, like a hanging basket off two nails in the wall, why he doesn't say the foundation is another interesting question, which I'm not going to speculate on here, but when I had that moment of revelation, it's not about family, it's not about fundamentally about family or justice or um, the environment. I mean, there are lots of laws about family and the environment and all those things. But Jesus summarizes it under this term love. Love God, love your neighbor. I was working in Tanzania on compulsory villagization, which was World Bank kind of, well, it was actually Julius Nyerere's policy and the World Bank was trying to analyze the consequences of it at the time. And I was working on that. I thought, I'll go back uh, down to my World Bank team on Monday um, and I'll say, hey guys, the answer to the questions we're asking is love. We have to think about love. And they'll think, I've gone bananas. <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Love. I mean, how do, you, how do you understand villagization in terms of love? And then I realized that love, of course, is a quality of relationships. And if I went back to the guys in the World Bank on Monday morning and I said, what we have to think about is, what are the relationship consequences of moving people compulsorily off the land which they've always cultivated in their villages and force them now to come to live in villages what are the relationship consequences of that move? Now, there are some big positives like better electricity for the kids to study at night, um, maybe better access to water because you cite the village where there is water, but no one thought about the consequences for the women of the firewood because they have to collect the firewood every day. And of course, normally they collect firewood from around the house and they keep planting the trees and making sure there's always going to be enough firewood so they keep the supply going locally. That's what the women were doing. But of course, once they're all in a village, they all go collect it around the village. No one is planting again because it's not my wood, it's our wood, and then it's someone else to do. And then they go further and further and further away to collect firewood, and that became a huge problem for these poor women because they had no firewood. And they would spend hours every day collecting firewood. So, but no one thought about that because they weren't thinking about all the relationship implications. So I'm going on far too long, but on we go. Time priorities. Oh, I should have mentioned just practical issues in the Acts and the Epistles. Again, again you know they're all there. You know the, um, the widows who complain uh, in Acts and how they resolve that. The Gentile churches and how... They collect money to send to the Jerusalem church. These are all relationship issues. So time priorities. So I said the scarcest resource in the world is time, not money. <clears throat> so my question is, why do we have everybody study, studying economics and not chronomics? So chronos, time, in Greek, as you probably know, we have chronometers on our wrists. Um, so chronomics would be the study of the distribution, use, saving, expenditure of time. And of course why time is important is because time is the currency of relationships. Time is the currency of relationships. You can only build deep relationships with people if you spend time with them. Time over time. It isn't time once, it's time repeatedly. 
Now, Jesus is amazing, and he can somehow create instant deep relationships. But many Americans, I know, think that you can create instant deep relationships, and I'm afraid you can't. And I'm sorry if I'm upsetting any Americans present. It just happened that I did my PhD in America, and that was kind of a particular aspect of my experience. But let me, having said that, let me mention how hospitable Americans are and how incredibly generous they are too with their money. Unbelievably generous compared to us Brits. Because I'm from Cambridge in England, I can tell you we're a mean old lot. <laughs> um, but time, time, time. So if time is so precious, what should be the first thing you do with your life? Not decide how you're going to give your money, but how you're going to give your time or spend your time. And we get hints of this in Jesus' life. You remember he chooses the 12 disciples. On one occasion, he's obviously by then lots of disciples. How does he decide which of these many disciples following him are the right people to have in the 12 and then in the 3? How does he decide that? Well, we're told that he spends, I think, a whole night in prayer before he chooses the 12. Now, in terms of your friendships, in terms of when your minister's in a church one day, how you decide how to allocate your time. My parents became Christians when I was six. And the reason they became Christians was because a guy who became quite eminent in Britain called Dick Lucas, and some of you will know him, I know he's a good friend of Mervyn's, decided one day that instead of going out visiting in the parish, because he was the curate in the parish, he would just spend time on his knees praying about who to visit. And the Lord laid on his heart very strongly to go and visit my parents because uh, there was a Sunday school in the church of 36. Four of us were from one family, <coughs> one family. so we were 10% uh, of the um, <laughs> uh, Sunday school. But he just felt the Lord was telling him, go and speak to, to them. So he went and knocked on the door of my mother, uh, of my home, and my mother was there, and she said, oh, nice to see you, Vicar, what would you like? You know, we come twice a year, etc." thinking. He said, well, are you a Christian? And she said, well, of course I'm a Christian. You know, I've always been brought up a Christian, and I go to church twice a year, and what more do you want? <laughs> so, you can imagine uh, Dick Lucas, if you knew him, would not be very content with that, but he simply gave them a book and said, read this, and if you want me to come back and talk to you more, I will. And of course they did, and then after six months of discussions, he said, ultimately, you just got to make a decision. And he said that to my parents, and, and they decided to follow Christ, and I'm the beneficiary, that's why I'm here today. Thank you, Dick Lucas for spending time on your knees asking God who to visit. But it was a time decision. He knew he couldn't visit everybody. Who do I visit? Well, let me pray about that first. And then there's lunch. Now, many people today don't bother with lunch, simply functional. But think about how much of Jesus' ministry takes place over meals. It's a huge amount in the Gospels that he spends time eating. Now, I think he's not a glutton. There's no, actually no indication of that. It isn't about the quality of the food. It's simply about the context for conversations. And conversations are so important in God's mind and so key to building community and relationships in any institution, including this one. Then think really carefully about who you have lunch with every day. Just think about those conversations as massive opportunities of, for getting to know people, finding out where they're from, what their issues are, uh, what's in the background for you, and sharing your experience and issues. But they're such wonderful opportunities. Lunches or any meals are fantastic opportunities for relationship. And I have discovered again painfully by experience that um, uh, Forgiveness is a huge barrier to the development of any relationship. And I say this to my great shame. Um, I say this to my great shame, but um, I was very, uh, I became very convinced that extended families were very important. So my wife and I were discussing one night, having a party for the extended family, and we thought, who should we invite? <laughs> and 
we went down the list and I thought, well, maybe not them, and maybe not them, oh, I'd rather not have them. So eventually my wife said to me, she's very shrewd, my wife, she's always putting a finger on <laughs> what's going on in my life, um, and she said, well, come on, you've got to confess up now, why don't you want them? And in one particular case, it turned out there was a, a very close relative, and she'd said something which I re had really upset me, it was actually about Nat. And I was really upset about it. And I just didn't want to know her after that. And that was, I don't know, five or ten years before. And it just had put a complete block on that relationship because I'd not forgiven her for what she said that day. And I'm sure she never thought about it twice. Just kind of rolled out. Now, obviously there's some history behind that, but, you know, I, when I realized that it was about forgiveness, and I pray every day, forgive us our sins, we pray, as we forgive those who sin against us. And I always tick the box in my mind, oh, I can't think of anyone I haven't forgiven. And then there's this party, and I'm forced to think about all my relatives, and there are some I don't want, and I find actually there are lots of people I haven't forgiven, even in my own family. And when I worked in Rwanda after the genocide, the big issue was how can we as a Tutsi group, now there were lots of horrendous things done by the Tutsis as well, I know that, but most of the 800,000 or a million people killed were actually Hutus. And I was there right after the genocide. I saw the whole thing in the raw. I went into those churches where they were just filled with children's clothes and toys where all these kids and adults had been burnt alive. It was a terrible, terrible experience, I can tell you. But it was forgiveness that was the key issue. Until there was forgiveness, then the relationships could not move on, ethnically. And it applies racially as well. Now, it's easy for me to say that, as a white person standing in a room, with a lot of black people in the room, where there's been systematic, systemic oppression for decades or centuries in many cases and I realize how hard it must be to forgive and please don't think I'm coming to urge you to think about forgiveness and reconciliation just because it's in my personal interest to do so as a white person. I am not doing that and I suppose I have some small credentials because I gave a significant part of my life and nearly had to sell my house because I got into debt doing it to try and help ease the process of apartheid ending of apartheid. And also we were involved as well in 93-94 to bring somebody here uh, into South Africa to bring the IFP into the election against with the ANC uh, in 1994 and who helped resolve that difference between Mandela and Botelese at that time. So I was involved in all of that and gave significantly towards it. So I have some credentials but it doesn't undermine the fact that it is English people who were behind this systematic oppression, not only in Kenya uh, and South Africa, which I know well, but also in other countries in Africa as well. I'm aware of that. But still, I say to you, and I'm saying to the Koreans now, the South Koreans that I work with closely, but I'm also, of course, in touch with the North Korean government as much as one can be, um, but I'm saying there has to be forgiveness, there has to be reconciliation. And I wrote a a huge book on peace in Korea, which sets out all of my ideas. I haven't got any copies with me because they're so big. <laughs> but I have a whole chapter at the end which is simply about forgiveness and reconciliation. And Paul says, you remember in his ministry, uh, when he's setting out his own personal goals, do you remember what he says in Philippians 3.10? He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and share in the fellowship of his sufferings. So knowing somebody is the ultimate expression of what a relationship is all about. It's about knowing another person, knowing them in depth. So I'm very tempted to skip over this one because I'm running, I'm sure, spending too much time here, but <laughs> um, I'll mention two things quickly in the middle there. Land reform issues, um, Africans, black Africans that I've known in Kenya and in South Africa too, have a much closer 
understanding of land and its importance than our Western individualist culture does. Because land is so important to identity and to our self-understanding, our communities, our extended families, and all of that. And I think perhaps the Afrikaners here understand this better than the English among us. But in economics, we used to have a, what was called classical economics, where there were three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Now, in neoclassical economics, we have only um, labor and capital. Land is simply a form, property is simply a form of capital. You buy and sell it like you buy and sell a car. Actually, a home is something much, much more than simply a capital asset. It's a place where you have roots and memories and associations and people come in and out. Um, I'm in Mervyn Elof's visitor's book from 1991 when I was in Stellenbosch talking to Max Zulu of the ANC at that time. But I was staying with Mervyn and his wife, Alison, <coughs> around that time. Um, and ever since, the families have connected in that way. Um, but land is important. And what happened with white people taking black people's land in this country and forcing them off their land in order to create space for themselves? And now the uh, EFF and others are saying, no, we want our land back. I'm saying, absolutely, you should ask for your land back and get it back, but in the process of doing it, you should handle it in a relational manner, because if you don't, you will not have food on your tables and your imports will all be about food and not about industrial goods. So it needs to be in a relational process, I believe, but it should happen. It should happen. And it's really sad that the ANC has not really pursued that agenda, although I think they're now starting to think about it more seriously. But land is such an important issue, and Leviticus 25, which is about the Jubilee, most people in the West interpret that as about economics. It's about the fair distribution of resources. Well, actually, that is not the way to think that the authors were thinking about it. They were always thought about the Jubilee in relationship terms. How do you hold the extended family together? How do you continue to give a family root, roots? I could go off on so many diversions, but just one short one here. 1 Kings chapter 21 is about Naboth's vineyard. And you remember um, the king, I can't remember his name, you know. Anyway, the king, Ahab. Ahab, yeah. Ahab coveted this piece of land that belonged to Naboth, and in the end his wife, Jezebel, arranges him to get it. And uh, poor Naboth gets stoned by the community on false charges. And then Elijah comes along. And what is it that Elijah says to Ahab? He says, you have killed, um, you have killed Naboth and taken his land, which is the whole basis of his extended family. Your punishment is going to be that every single one of your descendants is going to be destroyed. You destroyed his family, so the punishment is going to be fit the crime. Punishment always fits the crime in the way God operates punishment in the Bible. A wonderful book by Jonathan Burnside called God, Justice and Society. It's all in there. I think it's probably in the books that I mentioned at the end. I hope it's in your college library. It's the, really the best book on, on biblical thinking about justice. Anyway, um, he, he analyzes the way uh, that in the, in the whole Bible, God makes the punishment fit the crime. And here, the punishment of, a, of wiping out this family is linked to the crime, which is destroying the family of Naboth because he wanted the land. And priorities for education and um, also, education tends to be, on the Western model, extremely individualistic and competitive. We don't teach cooperation in our schools. We teach each of us to compete against everyone else in the class, to be top of the class, and get in the best universities. That's the story, that's the narrative, that's the goal. It's about my future, my goals. How do you redesign education to have a much greater focus on cooperation? Because 
teaching individuals to compete has advantages in terms of excellence. You learn excellence in your maths, in your English, or your whatever study, in your science, whatever it may be. And excellence is, does matter to God. But how do you also balance that with the need for cooperation, for learning to work in communities? So my grandson uh, at one of the high schools in Johannesburg was telling me that in his high school class, they divided the students between those who are going to argue the white position for ownership of land and those who are going to argue for the black position on ownership of land. But they had to, whether whatever their ethnic background or racial background was, they had to adopt that position and argue it to the other side. So he found himself arguing the African black position, a black African position, to the um, other white students in his class. And it was a huge education for him to think about it from the other person's point of view. And old Broughton Knox used to say, um, one of the other things he taught me, it's in that little book he wrote, what did you call it? Um, the Everlasting God. The Everlasting God. It's a small book, it's absolutely wonderful. And he says, you know, if you want to understand Christian love, use the term, or think of the term, other person centeredness. OPC, I call it for short. Other person centeredness. It's such a brilliant definition of love. But that means you've got to get into their mindset, you've got to see the world through their eyes, you've got to see it differently. <coughs> So that's all part of that. So I think I'm going to go on in about another five minutes, and then I will, I think, turn it over to you for questions. Um, but I think I just wanted to, uh, oh, I must mention this as well. There are five, I say five, aspects to any relationship. So how do you deconstruct the word relationship into its component parts? If you want to build trust, what are the five things to think about? So here are the five things to think about. It's about conversations. Now, you can have social media, but how many conversations take place? How often do you have an argument with somebody or a real discussion on social media? It's more about image, it's about information flow, but is it about conversations? I'm not sure how much it is. I don't use it very much. Others of you would know more than me. I'm not saying that social media is unimportant to relationship, but I'm saying it doesn't provide a context often for deep relationships. Once you have a deep relationship, you can stay in touch, it's brilliant, but it doesn't build deep relationships. You need those face-to-face -face conversations, you need to listen. It's about long-term relationships. Relationships build up over time. It's about regular, long-term contact. You can have friends at school and you don't meet them for 50 years and you meet them again and somehow you click into place again, like it was before. So that happens too. But for most of the time, it's about people knowing each other over time, staying in touch, just staying with people. And one of the things, again, I've learned is how often I misjudge somebody's motivations or character because I only see them in a moment of time. And then I judge what they're thinking or what they're feeling or what kind of person they are. But then later I discover, well, that was just after they'd had a major operation. They were totally traumatized. And if only I'd stayed with them for six months or a year, I'd have seen a totally different person. You can misjudge people if you just see them once and then form a judgment like that. Um, you need the continuity, you need multiplexity, that's many-sidedness. And that's the kind of thing you pick up over meals and so on. What are they interested in? What motivates them? What kind of, you know, what degree did they do before? What kind of education did they have before? Are they from a big extended family or is their family totally destroyed and broken up? What's their background in terms of what they've suffered in the past? personally or systemically, you need to understand all of that context to really understand somebody. And you see Jesus doing this. There's a, a wonderful piece again, which I can make sure you get hold of through Vianney, where one of our writers at the Jubilee Center explores this idea of these five factors in the whole pattern of revelation in scripture and finds it in every genre of scripture. 
And then we have um, parity, which is about fairness and mutual respect. And this is not about whether the fairness is seen to be fair. So um, the, the situation is um, uh, I remember discussing this on an airport in Australia for some reason. I was having an argument with a psychologist <laughs> about this. And uh, I was saying, no, no, it's objective facts you want. I mean, is it fair? Objectively. So he said, all right, how often do you talk to your mum who's in Nairobi? So I said, well, once a week. And he said, do you think that's fair? And I said, yeah, we have quite a long conversation every Sunday. I think that's fair. And then he said, does she think it's fair? Well, actually, no, <laughs> she doesn't. She'd like me to ring every day. So it isn't about always whether it's a fair in your opinion, it's about whether it's fair in the other person's opinion. It's about perceived fairness and perceived parity. When we ran the meetings between the white establishment and the ANC, this was outside London, we ran a, a number of key meetings between the top level ANC people and the top people um, in the ANC, top people in the government, and they would meet around the table. The big issue was where they sit. Who speaks first? Well, of course, the government thought, well, we're the government, we're going to speak first. We said, no. No. You're here as equals in the room, as far as we're concerned. We're peace builders. They, you both come as equals to this table. So we will vary who speaks first. We will vary the seating to reflect the fact that we do not regard one side as more important than the other side. That's what peace builders have to do. Whatever their personal views, that is what they have to do. Whatever the demographics may say as well, by the way. And commonality is about how do you find alignment of interests and goals? Where is the common ground? What we were seeking for between the NC and the white establishment is where is the common ground? And there was plenty of it once you started to unravel it. On the banks, the mines, the land, everything else, you could find, identify the common ground, and that becomes the basis for dialogue and opens up, we believe, things like the Odessa talks that followed. So, um, to say I was going to stop in five minutes, uh, <laughs> uh, I think I should stop there at least and give you a break. I may decide to come back and give you five minutes near the end if you haven't got enough questions.